Welcome to everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming to this event. Um, so we're going to be talking about how can Christian economists respond to the economic and societal landscape revealed and altered by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we've got a fantastic group of uh, speakers uh, lined up for you. Um, so I'm Michael Pollitt and I'm chair or convener of the uh, Association of Christian Economists UK. Uh, and I'm delighted to be welcoming um, both our own members and members from our sister organization, uh, ACE uh, USA. Um, and just to remind everyone of the, the sort of ground rules, we'll let the speakers uh, talk for exactly 10 minutes each, and then uh, reserve some time at the end for questions. Please do make use of the chat function in Zoom to either direct your questions to specific speakers or to make general comments and questions. And when we get to the uh, question time, I'll perhaps pick out some of the questions in the chat and, and pose those back to the speakers. Or, or I might ask one or two people to ask the question in person. Uh, and we'll aim to uh, finish at, uh, at two o'clock. Uh, uh, precisely. Um, we are recording the session um, for the purposes of putting it on, putting what the speakers say on our website, um, which we're very much looking forward to, to, to doing. Um, and um, let me uh, also thank uh, Mark Reader, who's done a lot of work organizing this session. I'm very grateful to Mark for all the work that he's put in in motivating us to do this and, and also um, reaching out to the speakers and, and organizing today's uh, session. Um, uh, for those of you who are members of ACE UK, our annual meeting follows at two o'clock, so please do hang on the line for that. Um, uh, and because we've got some important business to discuss at that meeting. Uh, so uh, let me just, um, uh, pray briefly um, before we start and then I'll introduce the speakers and, and we'll kick off. Um, so uh, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to meet together. Thank you for everyone who's here on this call and we uh, pray that you would just bless the time that we've got together. Bless our conversation and what we say and what we take away from this session. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, well, it's a it's a wonderful uh, delight to introduce uh, our speakers, which I'll do briefly. They're 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 all much too distinguished to be summarised in the brief statements that I'm going to make about them. Um, we've got Professor uh, Julie Schaffner from the Fletcher uh, School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where she's a professor of development economics. Delighted to welcome her from. Uh, ACE USA. Um, then we've got Andrew Dilnut, who's the warden of Nuffield College, Oxford, and a very distinguished uh, Christian economist and long-standing member of ACE uh, UK. Uh, then all the way from Australia, staying up late into the night, um, uh, Paul Oslington, who's Professor of Economics and Theology and Dean of Business at the Alpha Crucius College. I hope I said that right, Paul. Uh, in Australia. Um, and then last but not least, um, uh, Professor Robert Tatum from uh, the University of North Carolina at Asheville, where he's Professor of Economics um, so, and another distinguished member of both ACE uh, USA and I'm delighted to say also of, um, of ACE UK. Um, so thank you each of you for uh, joining us today. Um, and without further ado, I'll ask Julie to kick us off. Great, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to reflect on what we've been learning in recent months and to share some thoughts. Um, for me, the many lessons and questions coming out of this period of pandemic are tightly connected to thoughts about political polarization and Black Lives Matter. 
So uh, I'd like to mention some of what I've been pondering in these three areas of pandemic polarization and racism before turning to some possible implications for our priorities and practices as Christian economists. And I apologize because I, I get the sense from the pre-meeting chat that I may have taken the, interpreted the prompt in an unusual way. So uh, for what it's worth, here it goes. First, the pandemic. Um, starting with the mundane, think back to March. Many of us very quickly made big changes in how we do things, like moving our classes online and making big and beneficial changes in pedagogy. Uh, and a small lesson out of this is just the reminder that while change is costly, when we're willing to bear the cost, we actually can make big and beneficial changes in how we do things. So maybe we as Christians should be encouraged to think big about the ways uh, we in our profession can change. Um, turning to lessons that are more directly about the things we study as economists, um, the pandemic has created interesting opportunities to learn about many things, including, say, the responsiveness of safety net institutions around the world. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see a responsiveness that I hadn't known was there in the governments of lower income countries, most of which have fairly rapidly cr created new transfer programs for the groups who were falling into poverty. And there was a significant amount of experimentation with new targeting methods, new systems for digital payments, and so forth. Meanwhile, I get the impression that some of the big international aid institutions uh, were not especially flexible, sometimes slowing down the COVID response for reasons as petty as branding disputes. Um, so I think there's plenty for economists to study coming out of the pandemic, even though that's not what I'm mostly focusing on today. Now turn to political polarization. The politicizing of things like mask wearing dur during the pandemic make me think that the U.S. population is in serious need not only of more empathy across the divides, but also of some basic civics lessons, right? The lessons would recognize the value of personal freedom, but in my view, also acknowledge the many circumstances in which by cooperating, you know, by bearing costs that aren't clearly outweighed by immediate personal benefit, we can make things better for everyone. And I guess I wonder why many people are familiar with concepts like supply and demand, but don't seem as familiar with these really basic economic ideas about cooperation. They don't seem to be part of the conversation. So I'll come back later to the question of whether economists could do a better job of communicating about these things. Turning to racism, uh, let me again return to the early days of the pandemic. Uh, this is where I see the connection. My experience of that time was probably shaped by being married to a scientist who studies nasty infectious diseases like COVID. Um, I think those days felt scary and uncertain, and I think taught us a little of what it's like to fear an extra additional mortal threat in everyday life and to feel stifled by the need to take extra precautions every day to protect against this threat. And I think that this experience, as well as knowledge about the inequities in COVID risks and deaths, increased the empathy with which I responded to the killing of George Floyd. Tragedies like this had happened many times before, but this time it just hit me at a deeper level that Black families in the United States face an extra mortal threat every day that I don't have to think about. And they probably feel stifled and diminished by the need to take these extra precautions every day and teach their teenagers to take precautions and, uh, to protect against these uh, tragedies. And this is just wrong. So I started asking questions and I've learned many lessons, including, you know, to my shock at this age, how ignorant I have been about racism in the town I've lived in for 20 years and in my profession, about racism in the world of aid and development, where, for example, local leaders of color with lots of local experience and creativity feel angry and hurt about how their ideas are ignored by largely white expatriate staff from donor organizations. Um, what, what I'd like to highlight is one big lesson from this reading about racism and study of it, which I learned from Ibram Kendi's work, and that is how when it comes to racism, there can be big gaps between intention and impact. We can have the good intention of being anti-racist and still act in ways that hurt people directly or indirectly. And this carries a message of grace because it says, I can make mistakes without others having to infer that I'm a racist. But it also carries a message of responsibility because it means that if I'm serious, I should try to learn about the unintended consequences of my choices about how I speak and how I act so that I can reduce the gap between my intentions and my impact. So what might this whole potpourri of things, uh, what might be some implications for all of this for us as Christian teachers, researchers, and professional economists more generally. I wish my ideas here were more fully formed, but for what it's worth, I'll share what's on my mind. Um, 
My thoughts about teaching reflect this new interest in actively identifying and rectifying possible gaps between my intentions and my impacts. A first gap has to do with inclusivity. I confess that I've not always been responded ideally to the rising activism among our students at the Fletcher School about perceived lack of in inclusivity, which seems to put a spotlight on things like the use of words that we've used for a long time but may have harmful impacts, which I think made me a little defensive because I think of myself as caring a lot about inclusion and I didn't want to be perceived as bad for making mistakes. I now see that the better response, quite obviously, is to be more open and curious, to lean in the direction of making changes that might be good for people, and to recognize that I'll make mistakes along the way. Some of this new inclusion work is pretty easy, like being careful about pronoun choices, but I think some of it is trickier. For example, I think there is something about the way we teach and understand omitted variables bias that does kind of cast suspicion on discrimination as an explanation for wage differentials, make it somehow secondary, uh, uh, worth secondary thought, um, even though we don't intend that. And I'm just not sure how we solve some of those problems. A more grandiose and possibly crazy musing about teaching and impact has to do with those civic, civics lessons I mentioned. In contemporary economics, I think we have a very rich framework for thinking about human society and the underpinnings of human flourishing, a framework that's big enough to support healthy debate among people with differing political views. At least in the development field, we bring a very rich framework to thinking about how people make choices within which neoclassical concerns are just a small piece that we don't intend to make normative, certainly. We recognize that people interact not only in markets, but also in communities and other non-market settings, and that their actions in all of these settings are governed by institutional rules and norms that can be important for healthy interaction. The framework recognizes the importance of freedom and competition, but also of cooperation around public goods and many other things. So I think we could be teaching economics in a way that helps people learn this rich and balanced way of thinking about society. And that's probably our intention. But when you look at the way people in the world at large think about economics and uh, economists, it seems as though our impact is very different from that intention. Uh, I'm not sure we even seem relevant to big cu cultural debates or, and people assume we're on one side or the other. Um, just this past weekend at a student conference, I heard fairly standard dismissive comments about economists and their ri ridiculous assumptions. Um, and we know the studies showing students who have taken economics courses tend to behave in a more purely self-interested fashion relative to other students, right, in lab experiments. So I'm wondering whether we need to think more about how we frame our teaching of economics with an eye to improving our impact on how people think about the world. And uh, perhaps we should make more of an effort to paint this picture of a healthy society before diving into the mechanics of neoclassical choice and competitive markets. If we do find a good way to convey this vision better to our students, then I wonder if we could also find ways to take it to a wider audience, maybe starting with our churches, and maybe in a way in ways that foster more civil and productive debates across political divides. What about implications for research? Well, I think the discipline of economics has more to say about healthy society than many people give it credit for, but I think we also have less to say than we probably should about institutional racism. I look at the field of development economics, it now strikes me that race, caste, and ethnicity probably play a huge role in shaping the well-being of the people we study, and in comparison, the, the field seems surprisingly quiet about this. Maybe we should frame our field in a way that makes these concerns more prominent, and I'd personally like to see research that helps me think in a deeper and more practical way about the underpinnings of institutional racism in my own hometown's police department and abroad, we have well-developed literatures on other institutional questions, so why don't we have more on this topic? In terms of broader professional activities, uh, we probably need to look for ways to combat racism and sexism further, and, and in general, be more inclusive in our profession. Our newfound Zoom skills should help. And remember, we are capable of those big changes. Perhaps in the development field, for example, we should try more digital team teaching with professors in low-income countries. Um, finally, I just wonder how people like me, who are white from rich countries and who teach students heading into the world of aid and development, students who need more experience of, of learning from people of color and people who have deeper life experience in the countries of interest, should we be looking more seriously to work ourselves out of our jobs, replacing ourselves with professors who have the, those qualities? And what would that look like? So thanks for listening. Judy, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction and thank you for keeping to time. Um, I'm sure you'll have generated lots of comments, so I'm going to put some in the chat. Um, so please, please people do comment on that. So without further ado, Andrew, can I invite you to give your piece? 
Thanks, Michael, and thank you, Julie. And, and uh, I, I appreciate that enormously and, and agree with, I think, everything that Julie said. There, there are a couple of areas that Julie touched on that I'm going to touch on as well. Um, one is that ad adaptability. It's an extraordinary adaptability in the face mm -hmm. of, of a really big shock. But the other, which I'm going to talk about most, is cooperation and collective activity. The three, the three words I gave myself in my title were stewardship, insurance and uncertainty and I want to talk about stewardship because this is in response to this shock we've had to take care of ourselves and one another we are we, we've been taking action people have been taking responsibility all kinds of people have taken responsibility governments pharmaceutical companies hospitals individuals um, so, so the role of stewardship of looking after is I think seen critically here the second word I gave myself was uncertainty, as I think we cannot make sense of what's been going on now without recognising the really radical uncertainty that there was back in January, February, March, and, and, and the uncertainty that is still there. And, and we hope as economists that we have something to say about that, and we might hope as Christians we have some way of thinking about it, so uncertainty. And then insurance, because I think insurance or risk pooling acting together is has been an essential part of all of this nobody has done this on their own and and so uh, we need to think about how economists can think about that kind of collective action of which i think there's massively more than we normally recognize and as julie said we, we we often have a kind of neoclassical model in our mind that explains very clearly some very important parts of our economic lives but doesn't do such a good job in other also critical parts of our lives. So the need to act, and we needed to act in the face of this, we needed to act individually to protect ourselves and others, but we needed to act communally. We needed to work out what would be therapeutically helpful for people who, who uh, succumbed to, to the disease. We need to, work, we needed to work on vaccines. We needed to work to protect not only ourselves, but others by the way in which we interacted in our social lives and, and what we saw on the whole i think as julie said has been some astonishing adaptability um you know the uk economy the latest gdp because gdp figures are out for the uk economy today and it looks as though gdp in the latest month is 8.2 percent below where it was at its peak so that means it's still higher than at any time in human history apart from the last five years some things have been very disruptive but an astonishingly large amount of what we all do has been able to carry on differently and and we hope safely we've uncovered across the world some remarkable treatments for people who have covid so the uh case fatal fatality rate is dropping dramatically over time as we found ways of treating people who are ill we have the promise of some pretty exciting vaccines uh, out there. How does all this relate to uncertainty? Well at the outset it seems to me it was quite easy for us all to take radical action. At the outset of this we had no idea how, how bad it might be and it could have been much much worse than the pretty bad that it's already been. It could have been something which killed not a small fraction of one percent of the populations of nations but you know we have in human history seen pandemics that have killed one third of population so it seems to me it was entirely right and rational at that stage to be bold in our actions and i think governments did that correctly and that seems to me sensible how does all this relate to the doing things together well i think this has all been about risk pooling lockdowns and face coverings and social distancing and the discovery of drug treatments and vaccines these are all about things that we do together that we do in community the simple individualistic models of economics just don't work yet. and of course some of these are being done in the private sector um, through private sector risk pooling much of it through public sector and there are echoes here i think of the whole pentateuch story of jubilee of redeeming of joseph and the famine you know faced by the prospect of famine joseph under pharaoh takes in a very large amount of grain which will then be given out it's, it's risk pooling in action it wasn't feasible for us in the face of this threat to act as individuals 
And I think the story that that tells me for us economists, which harks back to what Julie says, is that I think we spend much too little time thinking about, writing about, teaching about, uh, educating our politicians about the massive amount of communal activity that we already do, the astonishing way in which our actions are not just about satisfying individual needs, but have consequences, good and bad, for others. And we see that, we see some of this communal activity in private sector insurance markets, but we see it probably most in public sector activities, public sector education, health, dealing with old age, tackling poverty, thinking about redistribution around the world. These are not things that make sense in the narrow model of economics that we all think is just uh, a small part of what we do, but I don't think we talk about it enough. I don't think we teach it enough. And in teaching, for example, about public economics, which you know, I, I think I should be making much more of the role of collective provision. And then of course we have as Christians a way of explaining why we might want to do that that isn't just about collective provision being the most effective way of meeting individual needs, but collective provision as a way of looking after and loving those other than ourselves. So I think COVID has been a, a big reminder of that and we should celebrate it. But I think, going back to what Julie said, I think as economists, we could reflect on thinking and speaking and writing and doing research much more about these collective actions than about the solely individual. So that's, that's something to celebrate. What's, what's tricky going forward? I think the thing that is hardest going forward is we're gonna to have to make a whole load of tough calls. I said at the beginning, I think it was quite easy just to say, lockdown, be bold, because we didn't know how bad things were going to be. Now we have more of a sense of who will die and how many of them will die if we make marginal changes. And we also know that some of the things that we're doing to avoid some deaths are having negative consequences for other parts of the population, for their mental health, possibly for their actual health. One of the things we're worried about in the UK is a huge increase in waiting lists for non-COVID related healthcare treatments as a result of both the direct and indirect consequences of COVID and the lockdown. So we're now going to have to make comparisons about what things we do and don't want to do and those are things which we all find intensely difficult and where I'm not sure that as a Christian economist I have a great deal to offer but I think that's going to be a critical debate over the next six months. How do we trade off uh, reductions in the severity of lockdown which may well lead to more uh, frail and especially elderly people dying against the mental health and other physical health consequences of continuing with that lockdown. I think it would be great if, if as a community we had some way of speaking into that. At the moment I just don't know how that would be but I think that set of debates is now one that we're going to have to face up to. It's not for me. Thank you Andrew, that was great. Thank you for <laughs> Um, continuing some of the themes that, that, that Julie had picked up on. Um, so, Paul, you're next. Thanks. It's, it's interesting that we've, we've all interpreted this brief from Mark um, rather differently. I, I'm waiting to hear what, what Robert's got to say, but I, I think um, Julie and, and Andrew, um, you know, I, I, I find myself in agreement with pretty well everything that you've said, but we've, we've all got, got different takes on this. Um, I might just comment about this strange um, thing called alpha crucis that Michael could hardly pronounce and most of our customers can hardly pronounce it, especially the Asians. But we're trying to start a Pentecostal research university in Australia, which may seem a completely bizarre notion to those of you in the US and um, even those of you in, in the UK. But Pentecostalism in Australia, there's now more Pentecostals in church on a Sunday than there are Anglicans. It's second only to Catholicism, um, which is kind of interesting for something that began as an Anglican um, prison colony um, and eventually Anglican state. Um, but the other thing is that much to the horror of Anglicans that um, Pentecostals aren't just numerous, but they're also, and this staggers Americans, 
um, Australian Pentecostals are more educated on average than Anglicans and Presbyterians. And Australian Pentecostalism is the most racially diverse religious group in Australia. So anyway, it might make some sense of this strange, unpronounceable project that I've got talked into being part of, um, I think six years ago now. Um, but on to the, the substance today. Um, my, my read on the whole thing, and maybe this is just because we've been much less touched by the whole COVID, um, certainly by deaths um, and cases in Australia than, than most of the rest of the world. But you know, I don't see COVID you know, changing a lot of things fundamentally. Um, I think it's exacerbating certain long, it will exacerbate certain things that are going on already. You know, I don't really see how it changes um, how we go about bearing witness and contributing as Christian economists. Um, I think we, we bear witness and we contribute as Christian economists within some sort of a, a providential economy. Um, providence, I think, is a doctrine for, for dark times, not a doctrine um, for times of, of, of plenty and, and triumph. So I think providence is a, a doctrine that we can um, you know, rest very well on um, in these dark times. And I think we can remember too that as, um, Anthony Waterman pointed out in his um, fabulous um, Christian political economy book back in 1990, um, that John Bird Sumner, uh, who as well as being an Archbishop of Canterbury was also a, an economist, an economist who um, Malthus um, lamented the loss of Sumner to, to the economics profession. But Sumner wrote of how now, economists had, economists in uh, the early 19th century, now, had a place in, in God's you know, plans for the world. And certainly you know, in the, the world of early uh, 19th century Britain, when you know, things weren't all that rosy for the, for the majority of people. And I you know, just want to make a few comments on um, you know, the, our different roles as Christians who are economists you know, in God's um, contemporary providential economy. Now, I think there's, there's a lot of different things, a lot of different things we're called to you know, as Christians who are economists. Now, the vast majority of Christians who are economists you know, are just doing mainstream economics. You know, some of them doing heterodox economics, but mostly doing, well, most, most of those who have jobs, doing mainstream economics and, you know, and public policy work. Um, you know, perhaps their Christian faith influences their choice of topics. Um, my friend Larry Anacone in the US, you now his Christian faith very much works out in his you know, choice of religion as a topic that he applies you know, basically Chicago style rational choice tools to. So for Larry, it's, his Christian faith comes out in his choice of topics. You know, I'd hope for most of us too, it comes up comes out in the, in the way we go about you know, doing our work. But I think there's something, there's something you know, noble and something that has a place in God's providential economy in doing economics really well. Um, you know, I spent last night also on Zoom watching um, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo giving a, a lecture that um, University of New South Wales had organised. I meant to be coming out in person, but it was all on Zoom like everything else. It was just inspiring, you know, the extent to which they had, you know, passionately in the, I think, Christian sense, you know, given themselves, given their, their skills over you know, to you know, making life better for people in the developed world. And I just think, you know, if we Christians could be, could be doing that, um, you know, what a great thing it would be. So, I mean, the majority of us, um, the, our place in God's providential economy is doing mainstream economics as well as we can, you know, doing public policy work um, as well as we can. And, um, but there's you know, really for the last, you know, I think since the early 1970s, you know, there's been, a, as we know, a, and this is partly where ACUK comes from, you know, a movement you know, to explore what a distinctively Christian economics looks like. You know, the Reformed, you know, inspired by Kuiper, have been most prominent in doing this, but they're not alone in it. I've been critical of, of that project um, on theological grounds. 
as well as economic grounds. But I think, you know, pushing the limits of what our Christian faith might mean for our economic works, work has a, have a low place in God's providential economy. Myself, I wouldn't describe what I do as being Christian economics. But I think more um, than that, I'd see the theological contribution of economics as, as theology you know, framing what we do in our mainstream work. I think the Catholics tend to do this better, actually, than, than people in the, the non-Catholic world. A Catholic social teaching, I think, is a, a really good example of how to theologically frame economics, um, certainly critiquing it at certain points, but not trying to invade the domain you know, of economic theory and empirical economics. There's a role, of course, for historical research in uh, the providential economy, um, which we're part, and I've spent a lot of time um, in recent years you know, in trying to understand the history of the relationship between Christian faith and economics. I mean, another, another role I think that certain um, Christians or economists feel called to do is interdisciplinary conversation. Um, you know, Jeffrey Brennan in Australia has been a, a model for me for, for how to do this. I've had a few attempts at it. Um, other people have had attempts at it with varying levels of success, um, mostly at the end of spectacular failure, occasionally at the, you know, at the end of you know, kind of modest success. Um, but uh, finally, um, I think there's a role for us as Christian economists in uh, holding out the good news to our, our colleagues. Um, Ian Harper, for me, in Australia, is a, as well as being a fantastic economist, in the, in the public domain. Um, uh, he's done some fantastic work in trying to um, engage um, people with the claims of the gospel through economics. And in fact, um, Kim Hawtrey in Australia, I've joined his then Sydney Christian Economist Group, um, which ended up um, disintegrating over you know, Kim's desire to move it in the direction of being a group to evangelize the, the economics profession. You know, and I think there, there really is a role for that. Me, I, as a, as a young graduate student, you know, was strongly supportive of, of Kim's push, but it, it, it ended up um, with the disintegration, really, of the group. So I think there's, it's often, we often see a conflict between all these different callings. You now, the people, the, main, the people who do mainstream economics you know, poo-poo Christian economics. Um, I guess I've been guilty of that a bit at times as well. And, and people who do Christian economics you know, will feel that those who are called to do mainstream economics well are somehow selling out on their Christian faith or, or something like that. And, and those who do history, well, they just leave most economists completely perplexed. And those who talk to sociologists and anthropologists and people in other disciplines, well, they're traitors to the cause. Um, but I think, you know, we, we all have different callings as Christians who are economists. And you know, I think there's, especially in these, these dark times, I think you know, we, can, um, we can try to understand each other's callings a bit better and maybe uh, at least um, be a bit more accepting of them in these, in these times. So I'll, I'll finish there. My clock is actually disappeared so i hope i'm within time michael okay good. thanks paul that was yep you were so thank you very much for, for sticking to time and and thank you for taking us in a sort of slightly different direction and giving us a nice perspective from somewhere that hasn't actually been affected that badly um i've actually written a couple of things in my with my economist hat on on COVID, you know for the economic society that you know i just i just i, I think those are the things i wanted to say today <laughs> Right. Thank you. Um, so, Rob, last but not least. All right. Greetings and good morning from the United States. Um, it's uh, it's tough going after these uh, fine panelists, and but it's great to be back with the UK Association of Christian Economists, even in this uh, form. Um, I miss seeing you all. Uh, I'd hope we were getting together in Glasgow, but uh, it wasn't to be. But hopefully, it will be this next year. So I always um, benefit from our time together. Um, I'd like to focus my remarks today around the notions of vision and hope. 
so some of this is coming about from what I've been thinking about uh, and how it relates in. So bear with me on a couple points until I, I can get to the to how it connects. But one of the things I've been comp contemplating, I even saw it over in the chat a little bit ago uh, with ecological economics, is I've been thinking a lot about economic growth lately. It's benefits, it's shortcomings. You know, we as economists, we're we're happy to tout 300 years of sustained economic growth, more food, better shelter, greater access to healthcare and education, longer lives. Uh, for these reasons, economists uh, and others have looked to economic growth to solve our social and economic ills. However, however, as you all know, economic growth in the United States, United Kingdom, and other industrialized countries have been slowing over the last few decades, uh, even independent of the recent financial crisis and pandemic. And this trend's not likely to reverse itself. Um, at the same time, uh, we're increasingly aware that economic growth has not been the savior we have once thought it was and would be. We've not been able to grow our way out of fiscal and environmental problems or dampen racial and economic disparities, coming back to uh, some of the things that Julie was talking about there too. Uh, if it wasn't already obvious, I think the pandemic has laid bare the problems our society face and the dearth of ideas we have for dealing with those problems. Uh, again, I, I believe we have been resilient, uh, but I think there are problems that are, are being uh, revealed that uh, may be um, uh, quite strong. So if our only answer is uh, that the rising tide of economic growth lifts all votes, what do we do about the storms like these that are knocking around many of our smaller and most vulnerable vessels? I contend that scripture can give us a vision for our economy. And then economics does what it does best. Some of you have already been talking about this by working toward the most efficient ways for achieving that vision. So for example, scripture speaks at length about such economic concepts as work, rest, debt, stewardship, poverty, integrity, and our relationship to others. Now scripture also says in Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. Uh, this is quite literally what is happening here. With more than 241,000 lives lost to COVID-19 in the United States and more than 50,000 lost to it in the United Kingdom. And so part of this point is about the role of vision in the story. I think without proper vision, people are politically divided. They turn to conspiracy theories. They think of masks in terms of their rights and freedoms and not about protecting the vulnerable. They demand economic growth measures, but not public health provisions, even offering to sacrifice themselves on the altar of the economy as the uh, Lieutenant Governor of Texas has, uh, has uh, done. And uh, they fight for their share of the pie without regard to the truly hungry. So I think scripture is a valid source of norms that can provide vision even in a secular society. If we uh, had a better sense of who we are and uh, as Christians in Christ, um, as well as what economics can bring to the table, we would have done better with uh, what I've heard Michael say before as this dry run for the apocalypse. We know much in economics, right? Uh, and some of you all have alluded to that, in, including in health and development economics, about appropriate policy design that could help us deal with the externalities and free rider problems evident in our crisis in ways that would help the most vulnerable in our society. So uh, for example, economist Corey White, he finds that for every two flu vaccines save someone else from getting sick and every 4,000 flu vaccines save a life. Now that's with the flu, but uh, we, we can think about the larger possible uh, positive uh, externalities of COVID-19 uh, vaccine and of course the financial risk to pharmaceutical companies. And so, you know, there are economists out there who are trying to like, how do we make this work? Uh, how do we get the capacity out there in a timely manner? How do we get people vaccinated? And so, you know, there are economists out there who are talking about direct investments to support production capacities, subsidization of vaccines themselves, now on the macroeconomic side, uh, we may very well be experiencing uh, a K-shaped recovery. You know, there's these, the Nike swoosh, there's the U, there's the V, but uh, there's now even the K, right? Um, and uh, the, the K is where the fortunes of high income folks are improving with the rise in the stock market as we've been seeing here in the US for sure. And uh, their ability to work remotely, while the incomes of poor worsen with the pullback in demand for some consumer services. So, just to give you perspective on this uh, from the United States, uh, employment rates among workers at the bottom wage quartile decreased by a whopping 19.3% from January to September. So, that's even with the, the rise back up some, while those in the top quartile have actually increased by 0.3%. 
With an economic vision that includes care for the vulnerable, we might leave our knee-jerk, standard, one-size-fits-all economic policies behind. You know, Julie was talking about how this is being done in, uh, in some of the developing countries. Uh, we might, uh, in this particular case, uh, pursue actually tax increases for the rich rather than tax cuts in order to fund the provisions we need for public health, education, and care for the vulnerable. And that's a different answer than one might give in a normal recession. Yet there's little vision to guide this economic work to the benefit of society. Now vision matters, but I would argue so does hope. And this leads me to mention the other item I've been thinking a lot about in recent months, uh, namely eschatology, uh, which is the theology of end times. Oddly enough, uh, eschatology did not come to my mind because of the pandemic or even because of the US elections for that matter. Um, I pondered eschatology as I wrote a paper titled To What Ends for Theology-Oriented Economic Policy Making, which was also the subject of a talk I recorded for you all earlier this summer. Now, you all know economics trains us to think about the general welfare, but eschatological thinking pushes us beyond this to contemplate what remains to be done. So consequently, Christian economists could and should consider the differential impacts that economic, social, and health policies have. So again, coming back to uh, things like systematic racism that uh, Julie had talked about. Um, as is evident in our current and political climate, failure to consider these differential impacts results in outcomes that negatively affect the general welfare anyway. So for example, uh, there's little doubt from development economics literature that we won't be able to fully solve the present economic crisis without solving the public health crisis too. But I mention eschatology here though, because hope is at the heart of eschatological thinking. You know, as can be seen with the Old Testament prophets, um, judgment can be postponed or thwarted with repentance and change, which to me suggests human instrumentality in God's redeeming work in this world. We have a role in this. Hope is what the world needs right now, and Christian economists have a role in, uh, to play in that. Uh, both in articulating uh, a biblical vision of human flourishing and in showing how economics can achieve that God-given vision. Um, since I've been talking about eschatology here, I'm going to use a quote by an eschatology expert, uh, Hans Schwartz. He writes this, If the church wants to be the reminder of the future, it dare not leave humanity as it is in its dispersion, antagonism, and self-destruction. And uh, I add to that, we must do as 1 Peter 315 encourages us to do. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks us for the reason for the hope that is within us, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And I say this even and especially in the public square. Now this path I don't think will be easy. Um, as Hebrews 11:13 notes, we are strangers and exiles on earth. Now surely economics as a discipline, you know, somebody was just talking about Duflo and Banerjee. I think our discipline is more mature and capable of addressing pressing economic questions than it has ever been. However, uh, in the public square, ideologies have dominated. So uh, I think Julie was the one who mentioned that, you know, we tend to have people who've just taken a principles class go on and be much more self-interested uh, than uh, maybe we in the profession would even want them to be. Um, religion also seems to be drawn into the public square in the same way, with secular worldviews affecting folks' view of scripture and faith rather than the other way around. So I'm trying to say that the waters have been muddy, that's for sure. But if done right, if done through careful study and with humility and prayer, I would say biblically oriented economic supportive policymaking would not only reduce human suffering, but would allow us to maintain our distinctiveness as salt and light of which Matthew 5, 13 to 14 speaks. So um, to summarize all this, uh, the Bible can help provide a vision for human flourishing as well as hope in these turbulent times. And our economic training can help us determine how best to marshal our God-given resources to uh, end and to mitigate the impact of these crises. So we must answer this call, right? To do otherwise, I think we're failing to give a defense for the hope that is within us. We would also be failing to, uh, to be the city set on a hill uh, of Matthew chapter 5. As the world looks to the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and to the Christians therein for leadership and resources. So uh, I'm trying to keep this brief so we can have a, a, a lot of good discussion. And so I'm going to end my remarks with that. Great. Thank you, Rob. And thank you uh, to each of our speakers for being so both clear and um, to the point.
Um, that, and thank you to the people who've been asking questions. Do do keep them coming. I, I, I'm just I've just picked I'm picking out a few of the themes that people have um, have um, have mentioned in the chat, and and let me sort of reflect uh, some of these back to the panelists. Um, so uh, we had mention of the fact that. Um, have poor countries responded better than rich countries? And in humility, is there are the things we can learn? You know, because clearly the US and the UK have not done well. Um, that we can learn from other countries. Um, does anybody want to respond to that, um, Julie? I'll perhaps start with you. Uh, I think I would first start with the caveat that it's not entirely clear how, how you uh, compare and, and decide that somebody's responded better than others. Um, it is the case that from what I've read that in um, most countries, the low and middle income countries, the new programming that they created was actually larger in dollar amount magnitudes than the programs they had already had in place. But of course that still means that uh, it's absolutely much smaller in the poorest places, right? Um, and um, we're actually very bad at targeting transfers in low and middle income countries. So how successful they've been is, is a question too. Um, so I, I'm pleased by the responsiveness. It did take time. It took less time in places that already had um, digital, already had national IDs and some digital payments and things like that. Um, so there are lessons there, but I'm not sure we can, strictly speaking, compare to the richer countries. I don't know how to think about it. Any other comments on have have some countries been more compassionate than others in their response? Mm -hmm. Andre. So the honest answer to that is I don't know. What I think is clear from the data is that there's an awful lot other than policy that appears to be determining how bad outbreaks are. So in Europe, for example, Belgium has had a really extraordinarily terrible experience, twice as bad as the UK is possibly more than twice as bad. And we just don't know why. Uh, uh, Spain, Italy, France are having it, are experiencing it very badly again now. Um, they did in the first wave. Germany is experiencing a massive growth in numbers and deaths now having appeared to have managed very well first time round. And then when we expand our gaze to look at uh, countries outside Europe, both, both wealthier and less wealthy, we see variations in outcomes that I think we just don't come even close to understanding. Um, if we look at India, for example, the, 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 the absolute numbers look high in India, but the proportionate numbers are incredibly low. And we're just genuinely puzzled as to why that's happening. So I suppose the other the other perception I've had about all of this is that it's also a reminder to us that human agency isn't always as powerful as we think it is. You know, there's a tendency to think policy is the most important single thing. And I think policy can be really can be really important in this space, but it looks as though there are all kinds of other variables other than policy that are strongly determinative of, of what the outcomes are. And, and we just don't understand that. Thank you. Um, so we let's have, let's have, I'll, I'll ask you. I'll ask you another one. So stewardship was mentioned a, a, a lot. Um, uh, has collective stewardship become more important now than we thought it was? And what opportunities does that give for a Christian economics? Rob, do, I'm looking at you. Do you want to have a go at that? <laughs> Does that assume Christians actually are nicer to each other than the rest of the population? Is, is nicer than they would have been, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Paul. So, you know, you know, one of the things, Michael, you and I have had these conversations and it may come across in my, uh, my talk is that, you know, one of the things I think our faith can give us is a sense of goals and visions. And, you know, economics is, is useful for... Um, or how do we reach those goals? And that's part of why I like what, you know, the Deflos and Banerjees of the world are doing is, you know, they're trying to figure out, you know, how do we best reach a, a goal in, uh, in development policy, for example. And so, 
so the idea of, of vision that would include stewardship in, in a meaningful way, I think is, is um, crucial to the story, not just this story of the pandemic, but the story of, of the racial issues that we're facing, particularly here in the U.S., of climate change, all those sorts of things. It feels to me that, you know, it's changing the narrative, changing the, uh, the goal set that we have, actually. I think just reinforcing that, Robert, it was interesting that they were both saying just how important hope was in developing countries and how important respect for pe people feeling respected was. So they're, you know, they're stealing our story. Um, they're stealing the Christian story. They're actually doing it better than a lot of Christians I know, which is sad. Yeah, and you, actually, that's interesting that you say that. I, I'm glad you mentioned that. But, you know, I've been thinking a little bit about institutions too, right? And, and you know, you know, we can look to the Bible and 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 see all the all the verses on weights and measurements and those sorts of things, and talk about how important integrity is in institutions. And again, you're right. This is one of those another area where uh, we see someone else taking that same message and going forward, and that's good. I don't disagree with that but that we are not actually making those messages as well as important. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me ask you another one, which has come up in the chat, which is, um, so what does this, wh where does this leave the economic growth agenda? Um, you know, we, I mean, for years, Christian economists have been saying, you know, economic growth, um, we're a bit skeptical about it. Um, what, what does the pandemic teach us about the prioritization of economic growth? Andrew, do you want to go about that? Because you mentioned GDP recovering and not being affected yeah. that much. I think, what it, I think what it reminds us of is what we probably always have all instinctively thought, which is it's, um, I, I tend to move away from thinking about, you know, prosperity is not a bad thing but it's a second order thing. Um, so, so people have been much more worried about the possibility of dying than about the possibility they might themselves be a little bit less well off than they might otherwise have been. But we also need to be wary of, uh, that, that's quite easy for, for the affluent to say, in th this shock, like so many other shocks, the people who seem to be hit hardest are those who are least affluent so so I, I don't think I don't think this is a I don't think this tells us that um, output is a bad thing or something we shouldn't be interested in but it reminds us very powerfully of what we should always remember that there are many other things for us all that matter a great deal and uh, economic economic success can contribute to those but is not a necessary part of all of them. Um, so I think it's a reminder not to think that, uh, which I think relatively few Western economists think when they think about it carefully, but many of us may slip into giving the impression, not think that GDP growth is the most important thing that we can have it clearly isn't and of course gdp itself is just a horrible average um which is a good way of summarizing something but tells almost nothing about about its distribution or how it's or the costs of achieving it julie i see you're wanting to say something yeah i'll, I'll just say um I, I think maybe we should learn to articulate better that um there is an overarching goal um that should shape policy making in all countries of the world that we can call development um, that is about uh, improving well-being people's lived experiences along many dimensions for many people especially the those that are poor and most vulnerable and um, economic growth uh, is one of the many multi-dimensional indicators that we would you know pay attention to to figure out how well we're doing because it says something about how we're doing at expanding our ability to you know have the resources we can use to uh protect people's health and you know all, all these other things that that we care about um uh and um 
well, I guess I'll leave it at that. You know, that, that I think we, we, we shouldn't, it's not like, oh, growth in, in some countries and development in others. We, that's something we should all be pursuing and uh, n no country in the world is terribly good at. It. Thank you. Um, Rob, do you want to say something on economic growth? Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the, the issues for me is how much we put an emphasis on this in advanced countries where it will not likely be high or, or the growth rate will be uh, high anytime soon, right? I mean, the U.S., other places we've seen, uh, you know, the last couple of decades dropped down to about 1%, a little bit over 1% uh, per capita growth rate in real GDP. And in the U.S., that's actually across different regimes. So the last 20 years, different uh, trade regimes, different regulatory regimes, different tax regimes, you haven't seen much budge on this. And so for us to put all our focus uh, on something when we're not talking about as much as the other issues as, as we could be and how those other issues actually have ways of affecting um, economic growth in meaningful ways, I, I think is, is a detriment to us. So I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say, gosh, you know, this is, we shouldn't figure out, use growth diagnostics or whatever it might be to figure out what are some best ways to get economic growth in, uh, in developing countries. And I don't say we should ignore it here, but just the time and attention and effort we're putting to it over everything else that could move our lives forward in some way. And um, I think about a, a study 2016 by Chad Jones and um, Peter Clonell. You know, they talk about this great, perfect relationship almost, you know, uh, uh, between um, GDP and uh, well-being. So they've got a great sort of study that they've done there, but they actually raised the point that you know, yeah, there's this nice trend line, but there's a lot of variance out there that, you know, like the median variance is like 35%, which really suggests to me and it suggests to them that there's a lot more direct ways to get at people's well-being than economic growth. And so I'm just thinking, let's open up the toolbox a little bit further and be talking about a wider set of things uh, that we could be caring about and thinking about. I think um, I've spent a lot of time reading natural law theory, you know, which is not just a Catholic thing recently. And I think in, in the natural law tradition, um, wealth is seen as, as something which is instrumental to human flourishing. I think the mistake we make so often as economists is, is focusing on that which is instrumental rather than flourishing itself. And I think that's, that's partly because economists, we just don't like to um, criticise people's choices or be paternalistic or something like that. And so we, we focus on the instrument rather than the, what happens with it. You know, and what I think really we should be interested in in the end, which is, which is human flourishing. And, and natural law, you know, I think is a far better set of tools for doing that than, than the, the utilitarian tools that economists mostly work with. But um, read more about it in Mary Hirschfeld's wonderful book about um, about how Thomas Aquinas approaches economic matters and how it contrasts with the way modern economists approach mat these matters. Hmm. Julie? Just one quick comment, which is that um, another issue is that I think that when you're thinking about how well is a society doing, um, macro measures like growth are not very helpful. I think we need to think of a society as being comprised of many different socioeconomic groups that are being affected in different ways by any one policy. And, you know, we need that disaggregated way of thinking about people and how their well-being is influenced. And uh, so that's just another piece to throw in there. Thank you. Okay, we've got, I've got time for one more and I'll ask people to respond very quickly to this. Um, can you give us a, a good piece of economics that you think uh, actually what this the pandemic has taught us is we need to, you know, pay more attention to good social cost benefit analysis or, or what? I mean, what, any, anything we should have, we should make more use of any good economic ideas. Julie? Uh, it's not exactly an answer, but I will just say I listened to a very nice podcast yesterday about uh, a, from a, an epidemiologist at 
Boston University who was interviewed by the American Economics Association about a paper that she had in the Journal of Economic Perspectives on um, what epidemiologists need from economists. Um, and there was just yeah. some really interesting stuff there. Great. Andrew? You're on mute, Andrew. I, it goes back to my going on and on about risk pooling. I think we we need to do much more work on collective provision in both pi private and public sector um, because the the welfare gains from it are massive. The welfare gains from appropriate risk pooling are huge, and we have we have a theological story about why it makes sense that we can root right back in Leviticus, but we also have an economic story about its power and I don't think as a profession we do anything like enough on that. Thank you. Paul? Um, I don't have a particular piece of economics but I think it's, it's uh, very interesting. I don't know uh, I don't know how it's been in the UK and in the US but economists had a very very low profile in making these, pub these you know, huge public policy decisions that we've made at the the public discussion has been dominated by the medical people. And I'm not sure that's all that healthy. I think that you know, we needed, economists aren't good at talking to people in other disciplines. And I think it just would have been so much more powerful you know, if economists and medical people and others had been able to sit around a table and talk and work together you know, with those making decisions more than they have. Thank you. Rob, last word, briefly. Yeah, uh, briefly. Um, so I actually, I agree with Andrew and what he's saying. I, you know, I think there's some sense that we need to think about how we avoid risk in the future because these things are going to happen. Crises feel like they're happening a lot more often. So thinking about a risk and thinking about the differential impact that things are having in a meaningful way. And, and to Paul's statement, you know, we have had in the U.S. massive, you know, different than almost any other country, massive amounts of, of, of spending, uh, government spending that has happened uh, in all of this. And, uh, you know, just being ready to be able to have some evidence and things ready when we, uh, when we approach these problems again. So, you know, it's always a new crisis that helps us think about things anew and afresh. But that doesn't mean we can't be good stewards and be forward thinking as well and, and think about how do we actually prepare for that next one. Thank you and thank you everyone who asked questions. So can I, can, um, I ask you all to um, show in some way your appreciation for our panel and the thank you for all your contributions today and thanks everyone for coming and God bless. <laughs>